All right. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all here in the room. And to those of you that are watching online, we want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, we're in week number three of a series called Killing What's Killing You. And, uh, you know, our focus has been on Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. I want to direct your attention back there as we kind of look at the foundation for this series that we're going to be building on here today and then again uh, next week. But Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Take a look. Here's what Paul says. He says, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. And we'll stop right there for a second and say, aren't you glad? That's good news for all of us. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do, for if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. This is one of the primary things I think that hinders a person in their spiritual growth and development. Uh, something gets in the way of growth and these things tend to short circuit God's plan for us. And Paul writes, hey, let's put to death those deeds of the sinful nature, those deeds that, that keep us from being able to live the life God's calling us to live. And of course, uh, he's talking about sin. Often what gets in the way of some of our best intentions uh, is something that keeps hanging us up. It's those deeds of the sinful nature that are killing us and they must be put to death. That's why we talk about killing what's killing you. So over the last few weeks, we've been using this analogy of a spider web, you know, and what it's like if you walk into a spider web and your immediate reaction is to start trying to get that thing off your face and, you know, you start looking around to go after other spider webs to knock them down. Um, that gets rid of the problem for a while, but these little creepy crawly things, they keep spinning new webs. And that metaphor probably helps describe some of what maybe has been going on in your spiritual life in days gone by. If you want to get rid of the webs in your life, you just can't knock down the web. You have to get rid of the thing that actually spun the web to begin with. As we said in week one, Charlotte has to go, you know. And so that's what this series is all about. You know, last week we said if you walk into the web of envy, chances are good that the thing that spun the web of envy is comparison. And uh, comparison so deadly to our soul. Um, it was funny, I've been having back trouble. And, uh, you know, I was at the chiropractor the first of the week. And I'd shown you last Sunday, you know, my 2001 GMC Sierra and then the big brand new F-150 or 250 Super Crew, four-wheel drive, you know, extended cab, all that. And then I walk out of the chiropractor and there's a great big yellow Tonka Ford. I've never seen such a thing. I actually went in and talked to the guy that was driving it. I, I did, but I sincerely say I didn't envy it. I just thought it was nice. And uh, <laughs> I didn't want his. I just thought, man, that's a nice truck. I've never heard of a Tonka, but they make them up in Northern Indiana or something. So I thought that was kind of cool. But, um, you know, uh, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, uh, our sense of worth sometimes and value and identity by looking at something somebody else has and their opportunities and blessings. And, and so we realize that that's, that's not a good thing. And then a couple of weeks ago, um, we said, if you walk into the web of worry, chances are really good that the thing that spun that web was fear. And so the invitation is to walk by faith. And it's not about clenching your fists and gritting your teeth and, you know, closing your eyes and just, you know, trying to believe something that's hard to believe. That's not a definition of faith at all. Faith is identifying your fears and stepping into those fears, except this time with the strength that God provides. Not doing it out of our own initiative or in our own strength. We're doing it out of the strength that God provides. And so we're going after the things that have the potential to kill us spiritually. So this morning, uh, we're going to talk about bitterness and anger. Now, I think all of us have the capacity to get angry. And anger has a tendency sometimes to pop up in our lives in unexpected ways. Um, anger is displayed in a variety of ways depending on your personality. Um, some of us have longer fuses and some of us uh, are fuses a little shorter. Some of us blow up, some of us clam up. I could do a poll here and see what the ratio is, but I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Um, some of you are kind of like a, 
a skunk when you get angry. You kind of go around and spew all over everybody. And then there are others that are more like a turtle. Uh, you kind of retreat into your shell when you get angry. Now, I want to be clear. God never prohibits anger. Uh, his word never prohibits anger. The Bible never says you should not get angry. In fact, it says just the opposite. It tells us we're going to get angry, but it says be slow to anger. It says in your anger do not sin, which means it's possible to be angry and yet not cross the line into something that's unhealthy or something that's destructive. Now, bitterness, on the other hand, is a different thing. In your notes, if you're following along on the app or, or in the worship leaflet uh, today, bitterness is often rooted in unresolved anger. Bitterness is often rooted in unresolved anger, and, and uh, resentment builds up over time as a result of that. It may be the result of a painful experience or interaction that you had with somebody, that, and that experience turned into a belief. And now that belief has become the lens through which you view all of life. It's the way you see others. I want you to see what Paul said over in Hebrews chapter 12. I want to break it down, the verse, in two segments. The first part of uh, Hebrews 12, 15 says, Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Now, that's a powerful sentence. Don't block the grace of God from coming into somebody's, uh, somebody else's life. None of us would want to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that can block the grace of God in other people's lives would be anger and bitterness. So Paul goes on and he offers us this warning in the latter part of the verse. He says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. The thing about this uh, idea of a root, you can't see the roots. The root's under the surface, it's underground. And Paul says, this root of bitterness, it can grow up in your heart. And maybe some of you have dealt with that. Uh, when it happens, you probably don't see it initially, not even aware of it. it. It's happening beneath the surface. And so be careful that it doesn't grow up to corrupt your relationship with the people that you love. We see an example of this in the life of Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. Uh, he was one of the disciples, but Peter had an anger problem. We know that. You can see it in so many of the interactions he had. And his anger issues flared up from time to time. It's surprising. But one time he even got mad at Jesus. You know, you'd think, oh boy, don't do that. Well, he did. He got mad at Jesus. Jesus was about to be arrested and crucified. And he's trying to prepare the disciples for what's about to come. And uh, we read this account over in Matthew chapter 16, verse uh, 21 and 2. And uh, I want you to see this. Uh, it says, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hand of the elders and uh, the, the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. This is what Jesus is telling the disciples. And then in verse 22, Peter just lost it. Look what it says. But Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him. Can you imagine? He began to try to reprimand Jesus for saying things and uh, this kind of thing. And heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Now, I think, we don't know this for sure, but I think Peter's heart's in the right place. Um, he's just expressing his honest emotion. I mean, he's, he's crossed the line though because there's an angry tone in what he said and he's telling Jesus, think about this, he's telling Jesus, the son of God, hey, this is what should happen. Now Jesus, of course, is a, he's an expert at reading hearts and he knows what we're thinking, he knows what we're feeling and, and what Peter said next, or what Jesus said next to Peter is shocking to say the least. Verse uh, 23. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. Ouch. <laughs> man, man, I mean, that's, a, that's heavy there. I mean, to call him Satan. And when he said that, um, what he said next, though, it gives us an indication as to why he said what he did. Look at this. He says, you, this is Jesus speaking, you are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. See, Satan can set some dangerous traps in our lives. Do you know that? 
He can set some dangerous traps in our lives. So Jesus is pointing out that we, sometimes we want to change our circumstances, but we have to understand God wants to change more than that. He wants to change us. He wants to change our heart. And Peter doesn't like the circumstances. That's really what this is. And and then Jesus offers Peter, as well as you and me, a way out of unresolved anger. In verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. See, the root of most anger is, I don't get something I want. I, I, I wanted something, I didn't get it. In your notes, it's spelled out this way, anger is often rooted in unmet expectations. Anger is often rooted in unmet expectations. Uh, What you wanted may be deserved. What you wanted may be something that's good for you, but what you wanted was something you didn't get. And right there between your unmet expectation and reality is a choice. You get to decide, how will I respond? How am I going to react to this? Are you going to allow anger to take over? Will you sit and soak in your anger, which allows anger to turn into bitterness? Are you going to blow up? Are you going to lash out? Or will you try to suppress your anger and bury it? Do you have the ability to to work through your anger in a healthy way? Something for all of us to consider. Are you able to guard your heart? See, our anger has very little to do with the person who makes us angry. It has everything to do with us and our emotional maturity. And so, our ability to handle anger, jot it down, it is a sign of emotional maturity. That's teaching in the positive. We could say it's a sign of our emotional immaturity, the way we handle our anger. Just a few chapters later, Peter's hanging out with Jesus and the rest of the disciples in the garden right before Jesus' crucifixion. And then uh, the Roman soldiers came along. They're going to arrest Jesus. And if you know the story at all, you'll remember Peter blew a gasket again. Um, He took a sword out and he cut one of the ears off of a Roman soldier. This guy's name was Malchus. Anybody remember that story? He took the sword, whack, there went Malchus's ear. How would you like to be standing there and see the ear rolling across the ground in front of you? Um, You know, Jesus picked up the ear and he snapped it right back on Malchus's head. Boom, there it was. Reminds me every time I read it about Mr. Potato Head, just sticking those ears back on, you know, just like that. And then he tells Peter to simmer down. And on the surface, it looks like Peter is stepping up to defend Jesus when this all goes down. But I am, I'm not convinced that Peter's outburst of anger had anything to do with injustice. I think there's a real good possibility that it had to do with fear. Um, perhaps Peter was afraid of what he might lose if his leader goes away. If Jesus gets arrested, what might Peter lose? I mean, Peter and the rest of the disciples, they were thinking that Jesus was going to usher in this earthly kingdom. And this angry outburst tells us something about where his heart might have been, where Peter's heart might have been. If anyone had a right to get angry in the setting, it would have been Jesus. I mean, Judas had just betrayed him. Um, Jesus is being condemned as a criminal, even though he didn't do anything wrong. But Jesus didn't get angry. Peter did. So what's going on with Peter? I, I wonder if Peter was dealing with some unresolved anger issues. In fact, I would wonder this morning in a room like this, or if you're watching online, is there a chance, is there a possibility that you maybe are or have dealt with some anger issues that are unresolved in your own life. If that's the case tonight, today, uh, if that's where you're living right now, I just want to issue this warning and say, beware. Here's a, here's a sign of concern. Beware. Unresolved anger often leads to bitterness. Unresolved anger often leads to bitterness. And the unfortunate thing about bitterness is you don't even know you're bitter until you're already bitter kind of has a way of sneaking up on you, see? And so I want to give you some indicators that bitterness may be brewing. 
in the back of your mind, in the back of your heart, in your life somewhere, what are the indicators that you uh, may have allowed anger to maybe head off in the wrong direction, an unhealthy direction that is potentially leading to bitterness? Here's a few things that you can be aware of. Number one is outrage. See, outbursts of anger are always damaging to the relationships around us, and it's always toxic in your own heart. Uh, Take a look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual, and and, and I want you to pay really close attention to this list because it is very, very um, clear and it's condemning. Sexual immorality, we talked about that just a few weeks ago. Impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, um, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Look what he says next. Um, Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty bold statement. And it makes me want to back up and say, hey, let's read that again. Think about those things that are on that list and understand that it includes outbursts of anger. What are we going to do about that? We need to pay attention. We need to be aware. Number two is revenge. That's another sign that bitterness may be brewing is when there's a desire for revenge. It may feel good. In the words of the great theologian, Carrie Underwood, (laughs) as you dig your keys... Into the side of his pretty little souped up four wheel drive. You might find some level of satisfaction in carving your name into his leather seats. It may feel good, some of you can quote this with me. It may feel good to take a Louisville slugger to both headlights and slash a hole in all four tires, but I'm still not convinced that he'll think the next time before he cheats. (laughs) revenge is a sign that bitterness may be brewing Uh, you may feel better but revenge doesn't resolve anything romans 12 tells us to never take revenge and do things in such a way that everyone can see that we're honorable and revenge is a lie that keeps us from getting well number three is silence and this one This one might resonate even with more people than the other two combined. See, the silent treatment has killed, think about this, the silent treatment has killed more friendships, more working relationships, and more marriages than we will ever know. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Resolve your anger as quickly as you can. That's what what Paul's saying here. It may help to take time out, uh, but over the long haul, the silent treatment is rarely an effective way to handle anger. Often, if we're not careful, it just leads to more bitterness. And um, anger carries with it a very high price tag. I'll try to post this this afternoon so you can look at the scripture references. But it it causes spiritual blindness. It affects my prayers. It's toxic to all my relationships. It becomes my own prison. It makes my offering to God unacceptable. It changes my personality and attitude. It leads away from God and into trouble. It destroys my health. That's what anger does. It's just not worth it. And so, as we look at some healthy ways to deal with anger, these options can lead our hearts away from bitterness. A few things you can do is first, seek to understand. Seek to understand. When you begin to feel the emotions of anger and rage building up within you, you don't need to suppress it or stuff it or spew it. Just take a deep breath, do what you need to do to calm down, and then seek to understand what's going on. It's always a good idea to start with a simple prayer, God search my heart. That's always a good place to start for all of us. Show me, Lord, what's going on inside of me. You know, what's my part in all of this? We need his spirit to guide us and reveal to us the truth. Let him search our hearts. Ephesians 4.31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil, evil behavior. It's leaning toward bitterness. Get rid of it. Number two, do your best to de-escalate 
the situation. If you want to handle your anger in a good way, in a positive way, um, do your best to de-escalate the situation. Figure out ways to dial things down. I love Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. It says, a gentle anger deflects... I'm, I, did I say a gentle anger? I'm going to stick with it. A gentle anger deflects answer. <laughs> I'll back up and do it right. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. If you begin to see things are starting to get heated, try changing your tone and just watch how a gentle answer deflects the situation. Number three, present an observation rather than a, an accusation. See, an accusation, when anger is starting to boil, uh, an angry situation like that, an accusation is like pouring gasoline on the situation. And I would encourage you to stay away from words like always, you know, where you say, you always do that, you know, because it never goes well to say you always anything. I mean, the light uh, is going to go off in somebody's mind. They're going to be fired up more than ever because rarely does anything or anybody do everything always or anything always. They, they may do it a lot, but they don't probably do it always. And when you say that, it just stokes the fire. And, uh, you know, when somebody hurts you, it, it may be intentional, but most of the time, I, I'm pretty well convinced that most of the time it's unintentional. And, uh, but to, to be able to come to somebody with a gentle word, a gentle tone and say, hey, when you said that, or when you did that, or when you didn't say that, or when you didn't do that, or when you didn't show up, here's how that made me feel. Here's what that did to me. Ask, is there any truth in this? Could you help me dispel the narrative that's running through my mind? And most of the time, questions like that can help to bring some clarity. Uh, they can help us move the situation from nuclear to rational. And you've probably been involved in the last few days or weeks or months with some situations that needed to be moved from nuclear to rational. This could help. Um, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, better to be patient than powerful, better to have self-control than conquer a city. Maybe some of you are wrestling with bitterness right now because of something that happened a long, long time ago. You can't do anything about what happened now. now. I mean, maybe you're wrestling with bitterness right now because of one of your parents. They consistently manipulated your emotions when you were growing up, or maybe they were just never around for you when you needed them. Maybe you're bitter because of a close friendship and that friend betrayed you, they betrayed your trust, and there was never any resolution to that. Maybe you're wrestling with bitterness right now because you, know, you don't want to go to work tomorrow because you were overlooked for that promotion and you put in the time and the energy and the effort and somebody else took the credit. See, some of you are bitter because somebody cheated on you. And it, it still hurts even though you decided to stay. Some of you are wrestling with bitterness because something changed and nobody asked your opinion. And here's the thing. And this, this needs to be spelled out. I hope you hear this loud and clear. Your anger isn't wrong. Maybe it's entirely justified. Anger is an honest, healthy emotion. And in many cases, what happened to you was wrong. It was dead wrong. But your unresolved anger may become a poison that turns into bitterness. And even though your anger may not be wrong, it can still take you to a bad place. And it can lead to sin in your life if it is not handled properly. Anger can harden your heart and turn to bitterness. See, your health is determined in part by what you eat. But your health is also determined in part by what's eating you. And uh, bitterness is like an emotional cancer. It really is. And, and it may be caused by words or the actions of somebody else, but they can't make you bitter you and I have to do that for ourselves. Nobody else can make you bitter. You do that for yourself. And at some point, we've got to draw a line in the sand and I've got to decide, I'm not going to allow this to make me a bitter person. I'm not going there. I'm not going down that road. That doesn't mean you deny reality. It means that at some point, you choose. You choose to forgive. You say these words that are some words that we, for some reason, hate to say, but we love to hear. I 
forgive you. I forgive you. See, the disciples asked Jesus about forgiveness one day. You remember? And, uh, you know, somebody said, how many chances should we give somebody, Jesus? I mean, what's the right thing to do? We've, we've heard seven is a good idea. I mean, what do you say? And he said, well, how about 70 times seven? And they're thinking, what? 490? Are you kidding me right now? I mean, is that right? 490? No, 490 was figurative language. He didn't really mean 490. It was figurative language. He was just trying to, to make a point. Jesus was basically saying forgiveness should be a way of life. It's, uh, it's like breathing. How many times a day should I breathe during the day to stay healthy? I don't know. Just keep breathing. That's a good idea. Um, how many meals should I eat between now and the end of my life? I don't know. Just keep eating. Now, some of you haven't said amen in church in your whole life. I set you up and you missed it. So you got to be ready and pay attention if you want to be in on this. How many times should I forgive, Jesus? I don't know. Just keep forgiving. Have you noticed that we live in an angry world today? And just look around in homes and families and marriages stores, at work, sometimes in churches, out on the street. We live in an angry world and people get angry at the drop of a hat. And one of the distinctive ways, and this is what I, I hope you hear, one of the distinctive ways that we live as Christ followers is in how we handle our anger. And see, when people inquire and they see there's something different and they wonder, why are you so different? Why did that not get you upset? Why did that not cause you to blow a gasket? Why did not you not go off on them? We can let them know it's because I'm extending the grace that's been extended to me. See, God forgave me when I didn't deserve it. And as I've been forgiven, I choose to forgive because I can't do this on my own. And it is only because of the Spirit of God living in me that I'm able to do it. This is not something we can do on our own. You do understand. We're going to need his help. And see, when you forgive, you're unlocking the prison cell that for some of you may have been holding you captive for a long, long time. So here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Spirit of God before we go today. See, we teach toward application here, and we want you to be able to respond to the Spirit of God. I, I, you not respond to me, but I want you to be able to hear from the Lord and do something about it. Somebody told me just the other day, they said, you know, I've been to church in places where I walk out, and it's like, what was that all about? And they said, when I come to the point, I feel like when I've been there, I can walk out and say, that made sense, that's going to make a difference, that'll change the way I live this week. And that's what I pray for you that when you hear what we're talking about, you say, God, okay, what does this mean for me? What am I going to do about it? How does this apply in my life? And so I want to I tell you right now, you can respond to the Spirit of God before we walk out of the doors of this place, before you turn off your computer, before you put your phone down. You can just decide right now, I'm going to receive Jesus. That's a decision you can make today. You can make a decision that you're going to release your anger. That's a choice that you can make. You're going to confess your bitterness to God. Or you can decide today, I'm going to choose to forgive. But right now, wherever you are, whether you're seated or watching online, wherever you are, I, I just tell you, this is what you need to do. Tell the Lord, say, I give up and I will put to death the deeds today of my sinful nature. And you say, well, I don't know how to do that. You're going to need his help and you need to turn to him. But don't make the excuse or the cop out or sidestep and say, well, I don't know if that can be done. It can be done. That's what Paul told us to do. Put to death the deeds of our sinful nature. In this instance, it's anger. And we must kill it. Because if you were honest, there are people listening today who would have to say, you know, if I'm honest, yeah, I would admit it. It's killing me. It's killing me. And it doesn't have to be that way. And so let's be open to the Spirit of God as we pray.
Would you bow with me, please? Father, um, we come to you right now, and I, I just want to pray that you would release people from the prison of bitterness and anger today. Maybe they walked in the room or turned on their computer and they didn't even think about the fact that they were bitter or they didn't think about why they've been so angry, but this, this poison, it's taken root in their heart. And today, it's like you just walked in the room and turned a light on in a dark place and you've exposed something in their lives. And so Lord, I pray you would soften our hearts today radically change some people's lives this morning. You're the one who can do that, but it begins with a decision that we make to surrender these things to you. And today, Lord, I'm praying that you would deal with our rebel hearts, that you would put to death those deeds of the sinful nature because of decisions that have been made today, that we would kill what's been killing us. And so today I pray you would move people from darkness to light move people from death to life because of your grace. Have your way in us, each one, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to the words of this song.